Clear Coating, the pinnacle of pinball restoration skills. Or is it? Clear Coating is easy, but it's the pre and post work involved in the process that will test the patience of any detail-oriented individual. Chances are if you're watching this, then you too care enough about your game to protect it and give it that wet and shiny look that everyone else enjoys. There are many ways to go about doing this, and I'm going to walk you through it, step by step. Hopefully by the end, you too will have the confidence needed to perform this process yourself. Are you ready? This is by far going to be the most analyzed and most critiqued video that I put out to date. Understand that the following content is not the only way that you can clear coat your playfield. There are way too many variables for me to list here on the different ways people go about doing this process. What I will recommend that you do is follow the forum thread on Penn's side under vid1900's How to Restore Your Pinball Playfield. It's like the ultimate guide to pinball playfield restoration. A large chunk of the info in this video is due to the knowledge that he has shared willingly amongst all of us. Please use caution when dealing with the chemicals involved in this process and wear the appropriate protective gear. Straight down the middle, including myself, are not responsible for any damages that may occur to your project. If you plan on following along with these instructions, you do so on your own accord. Thank you. Okay, now that the disclaimer is out of the way, let's get down to business. When it comes to clear coating your playfield, you have two main decisions that you need to decide on. First decision. Do you want to just disassemble the top side and that's it? Or do you want to disassemble both sides to where all you have is the play field and you do not have to worry about the mechanics or electronics that will be left behind during cleanup and post work, pre and post for that matter. For this video series, I'm going to be doing top side only, which tends to be um, a, what a lot of people do because some people, not all of you, get a little nervous when it comes to completely clearing the back side of a play field and rightfully so it can be a little intimidating but I will say that due to my experiences I for now on will be disassembling top and back of a play field because it's gonna make the pre and post work just so much easier Sonny, we can do this the easy way or the hard way but as you're going to find out throughout this video series, we're going to be doing it the hard way. So this is actually going to be a little easier, I think, for a lot of you, since I'm going to have a lot <laughs> of things going against me on this. You should be able to get the same results in probably a lot easier way than what I'm going to be. Now, granted, some of those decisions that you make are going to cost you more money. You can go about doing this a little bit easier. So first off, and obviously, you're going to be taking everything off the top side of your play field, leaving nothing sticking up. Basically, anything that is going to be on the top side of your play field will be getting clear coated. You can't just mask off certain areas and expect things to go well in the end. No, you need to remove everything. This play field, I've chosen not to do a complete full restoration when it comes to paint touch-ups or anything like that. All I've done is around the scoop areas has done a wood epoxy to basically form the holes and make it to where it's a solid sheet and just to where it needs to be. I'm not going to worry about doing paint touch-ups because you're not going to see these wear spots anyways because uh, you're going to have clippies over these scoops. So all I'm, all I'm doing is basically prolonging the life of the clippy protectors. So after you disassemble the entire top side of your play field, now becomes more prep work. Now you're going to need to get some painter's tape and just mask off every crevice of this play field to keep from clear coat escaping down and getting up underneath your wires and just causing further issues. On this play field, I have every switch slot, every pop bumper hole, every scoop, everything is masked off to where clear coat cannot just easily escape and go down there and cause further issues in my post work. 
Along with getting all your holes masked off, you want to also further make it easier for dealing with this playfield and moving it around by usually zip tying like a lot of dangling mechs or switches, zip tying those to other areas to keep everything tightly bound to the backside to where if you have to pick up this play field to move it or deal with it, things aren't just gonna be getting in the way and just falling to the ground. It just makes it a lot easier to manage if you control where all your switches and everything are at by zip tying or you can use some painter's tape, tape around other stuff to get it all nice and snug and controlled. You also want to have your wire harness completely inside of a large Ziploc bag. I'm just using a basic Walmart bag right here just to kind of control them to keep them inside there so that way if any clear does get in there, it's not going to get all over your wiring harness. But it's not just clear that I'm worried about here guys, it's the post work involved with all the sanding and stuff like that. We don't want a bunch of residual just getting down there and gunking up stuff, trust me, you don't want to have to deal with that mess. Once you believe that you have everything under control, masked off, now we can make sure that our play field is ready for sanding. Sanding? What? You mean you want to sand before we even clear coat? Yes, I know this is going to sound bad and this is going to be something that you're going to be really iffy about doing, but if you want your clear coat to actually stick and not lift, then you're going to want to make sure your play field has some tooth to it. This is uh, basically, I'm going to use in this video, I want to say 500 grit. Uh, I would probably go up to maybe an 800 just to play it even more safe for you people. But use an 800 grit sandpaper and go over the play field like so. I'm not applying a lot of pressure. I'm mainly just letting the sandpaper just kind of dig in and this is going to give the clear coat more surface area to grab onto. If you do not sand your play field before you clear coat, then you are asking for trouble down the road. When sanding your play field, you need to watch out for any kind of obstructions like GI bulbs that can stick a little further out of the play field than anything else. This will uh, and eventually tear your sandpaper if you go over it hard enough or at just the right angle and it's just more frustrations that you have to deal with. Sometimes you can kind of push them down just a little bit further or just be careful when sanding around them but still make sure that you get every nook and cranny sanded that clear coat is going to be touching guys. You want to make sure you get into your shooter lane all that kind of stuff. Any area that does not get sanded is more likely gonna have lifting for clear coat if it's not sanded. I'm just telling you how it is. That's what's gonna happen, guys. Okay, so you've given your play field a good once over or twice over, whatever you believe to give your play field enough tooth. Now it's time to get this thing cleaned up by using naphtha. Naphtha is going to be a chemical solvent that you're going to be using a lot of, so don't skimp on the quantity when you purchase this. If you have doubts on what your play field is going to look like clear coated, take naphtha, put a little bit on a microfiber cloth, and just wipe a certain area of the play field. That will give you a real quick look at what your play field will look like once it's been clear coated. So if you're sanding and you feel like there's no way this is going to look good, Put a little naphtha on there, wipe over it, and for a few seconds before it evaporates, it will give you a good idea of what that play field's gonna look like with the deep dark colors and the shiny look as well. But we're gonna be using naphtha throughout this entire process, pre and post. So after you've sanded your play field, you obviously need to clean your play field because you don't want any loose debris getting into your clear. This is something that I need to stress guys is that the point of clear coating your play field is to preserve it, to make sure that you're protecting it. So if you're going to clear coat and not worry too much or put much effort into the pre-work and making sure everything's like clean and ready to go, then you're going to basically just put clear on something and it's just going to be protected, but it's not going to look as good. So one of my primary objectives is what I'm doing is it's like filters and a clean room and stuff like that to help control particles. This is not going to be a single coat and we're done guys. This The first coat that you're going to be performing on your play field is nothing more than a foundation and to lock everything in place and then you can build off of that. So even if I were to be doing any kind of touch-ups with paint or anything of that nature, I wouldn't do that until after I've clear coated because I want to lock in the wood fibers in place and then I would paint. But I'm not going to be doing any kind of painting in this video. Maybe down the road we can go into that. 
I'm trying to give you a little more emphasis on what this clear is going to do. So your first coat is at first going to look really good. But over the next 24 hours, you're going to find that this clear is going to amplify and make every defect in your play field magnified. So a deep scratch, sunken inserts, um, you know, pitting, anything like that you could think of, this clear coat is going to magnify that to really show you in 24 hours. So if you're trying to preserve a play field that has a lot of flaking paint and then the more you kind of like mess with it, it's only going to get worse, then you really don't want to sand too much over those areas, guys, because you're just going to knock off more paint. It's just going to be more touch-ups that you're going to have to do down the road. So uh, as per usual, like I said, there's a lot of variables to this. So this is mainly going to cover those that do not require any touch-ups on their plate field. Also when sanding, you do not want to use just your hand and sandpaper. This is just asking for trouble when it comes to how level your plate build and clear is going to be. You want to use a block sander and eventually when we get onto wet sanding, you're going to see what I use there. Because typically when you're sanding with your hand, your hand is going to naturally form and go into any kind of crevice. So you're not going to have a level playing field. Now when you're first sanding, it's not going to matter too much because you're wanting to get everything rough. But when you're coming to leveling your play field flat on wet coating or wet sanding rather, that's when you're going to make sure you don't want to just use sandpaper in your hand because it's just going to be a big issue down the road. Let's move on to your pneumatic equipment. I'm going to be pretty much accomplishing this clear coating task on hard mode, <laughs> like I said earlier, because typically when you want to accomplish this task, you want a really large air compressor to make sure that you've got enough volume to accomplish your task without running out of compressed air, obviously. So ideally you want like a 26 gallon plus. I'm going to be accomplishing this task with this. That's right. Contrary to popular belief, you can accomplish this task using subpar gear. And that will definitely be in the comments down below, people talking about my Harbor Freight clear coating gun and stuff like that. But the end result is gonna show you that it can be done. Any connection that requires you to screw in, you wanna make sure that you have a couple of rounds of a plumber's tape around the threads to make sure that you've got a good air lock. If you have everything screwed in, put together, and you can hear air seeping out of any connection, you wanna solve that problem right now. I'm already on hard mode with a little bitty compressor like this. I don't need extra air escaping into the wild. I need all I can get. I also have a filter attached at the base of the gun. This is gonna make sure I don't get any unwanted moisture or dirt or anything like that from the compressor to the gun. So let's go over some of the equipment, guys. Now, majority of these items I purchased at Harbor Freight. Others that were, you can get at your local hardware store like Lowe's and stuff like that when it comes to the chemicals. So I've already gone over naphtha. You need a good amount of that. You're also going to need lacquer thinner. This is going to be a chemical very useful for pre and post work of your clear coating gun to shoot, to make sure the gun is clean to shoot and to make sure the gun is clean after you shoot. Mesh strainer filter. This is to make sure that we don't get any unwanted particles into our clear. This is a P95 mask purchasable at Harbor Freight. This is, I want to say, the minimum when it comes to air purifying yourself and for this process. This is the minimum use, guys. I've seen people online using just a simple like mask that, that is good for like mowing the lawn but is not safe for clear coating. You're gonna need at least minimally this, but you know, I know people that use a full body suit with supplied air, praise by all means, go for it. The safer, the better. Some of your compressors will have a built-in air regulator and the gun itself has an air regulator. I'll go over that later, but I'm, I've got another air regulator that I keep at the gun so that way I can monitor it while I'm shooting in case there's any kind of issues and just to make sure that I have a constant flow. And of course your spray gun. When it comes to what clear coat should you use, that is gonna be a debate that will never end for a lot of us in the pinball industry. People have got their own opinions slash even facts to prove which one should be used and which ones should not be used. All I can say is, you know, do your research. Uh, go on Pinside, see what results people are getting. Uh, you're gonna see me use this clear coat on the first coat 
but I change it up and we'll go over why when we get there. Along with your clear coat, you need of course the corresponding activator for it. The measuring cup to measure your clear coat hardener to clear coat ratio, usually it's a four to one. Eyedroppers for some post touch up work. Trust me, you're gonna want these. You can get these at your Walmart in the medicine area. This is where I got these at. A stirring stick to mix your activator and your clear coat. Gloves, obviously, and of course, goggles for eye protection. All right, your basic $15 HVLP gun. So some of these settings that you're gonna need to adjust on here to how you see fit is your built-in air regulator. You wanna basically have this thing all the way out as far as you can to where you want it just barely on there so that's going to be your internal air regulator i don't use this because i like more accurate control that's why i have my air regulator that i attach to my gun so this is just to make sure that it's not utilizing this portion of it uh this right here is going to adjust the fan the fan amount like how big your spray is going to be so this is all the way down right now i would max it out and then do a full 360 around. But your gun may be a little bit different. That's why you do the spray test before you shoot just to see how big your spray is gonna be. And the amount of fluid that comes out can be adjusted by this bad baby right here. I usually have this thing all the way out as well. So once this is, see this is going in, that's going to limit the amount of fluid that will be released. So I would basically unscrew that out as far as I can and then tighten it in place right there. And then I'll do some test sprays and adjust accordingly. Okay, so you've got all of your equipment needed, you've got your play field sanded, you've got your play field cleaned. Let's get this thing in the paint booth. Another important factor that some people <laughs> completely forget about when they're doing this is to make sure that your play field is of course level. I'm taking your basic level here and measuring the X and Y all over to make sure I'm as flat as I can be. Starts out being off, but surprisingly enough, and what I use to solve this problem are pennies. Yeah, I know, you're thinking, what? But they're cheap, uh, they're sturdy, and there's plenty of them out there. So I actually just use pennies, and depending on the what you're actually shooting on determines what you're gonna use to get your play field level. You can level your play field however you want to. This is what I'm gonna use, but as long as you accomplish the same end result as making sure your play field is level, then that's all that matters. Just make sure it's level, and sturdy. You don't want the slightest movement to cause it to wiggle out of place because you're gonna be clear coating on this and you don't want it to be sitting there and then all of a sudden something falls off and collapses or falls onto it. Trust me guys, you want stability and consistency for this process. All right, so our play field is level. It is in position. We've got all of our gear ready to go. I think it's time to get this clear coat mixed and start shooting. You want to make sure that when you are spraying your gun that you are at a solid 40 PSI. Different strokes for different folks, but this is the PSI that I will be using for this particular gun. Before we just go running in and pouring in our clear coat and just spraying our play field, we want to make sure that our gun is calibrated and our air pressure is consistent. I'm going to be using a regular sheet of cardboard and water just to deter the fan size as well as the amount of volume that is spraying through my gun. I'm going to be spraying this just over and over again at different amounts of volume and distance just to give you the idea of how much volume is going through this gun. This is the time where you get to test to make sure that your air pressure is consistent. Once I have my fan size as well as volume dialed in and my air pressure looks consistent at a solid 40, 
I'm ready to move on. Before using actual clear coat, I will be utilizing the lacquer thinner. I pour just, you know, a good amount into this gun, swish it around, and then spray to make sure, one, that my gun is clean and working functionally, and two, that if there's any other residual or dirt, grease, moisture, that the lacquer thinner should be able to take it out. Once the lacquer thinner has been completely depleted from my container, my gun should be clean and be completely prepped to accept clear coat. So something I need to stress here, guys, and that is once again that this is clear coating two-part auto clear. This is some nasty stuff. This is not something that you should just take lightly. This can be very dangerous to your health. So please use an air mask and protection when dealing with this. Oh, I need a nuclear reaction. The generator the 1.21 taking with the electricity that I need. So we're going to be putting on our equipment and start mixing the clear. So I'm mixing it to a four to one ratio as per the container requests. Now I'm gonna show you here why we use filters in a redundant matter because we want to make sure that we are getting the best look at our clear and these containers sit on a shelf in my garage and they obtain dirt on the top and the lids so whenever it comes to me pouring That's things in filter, there's a folks. very good high chance that you're going to get dirt or dust or whatever falling into the clear and, and this proves filter. it right here I don't want to use all of it I'm going to need to save some of that for eye drops. So once you pour your activator into your clear, that activator is going to work, guys. So let it be known that this first coat is not going to go very well. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, I have a fast hardener, and that is due to the previous play field I did during the winter. So um, I used a fast hardener and it is currently in my garage at this point, like 95 degrees outside, 43% humidity, I wanna say. So once this activator is in there mixed up, stirred up, it's already going to work. It's already starting to activate the clear. So you need to mix it and then pray that you've got everything ready to go with no stop, no issues. That's not the case for me here, guys, because I forgot a very important step in the preparation process before you clear your play field. You can see me as I start to use the tack cloth to make sure I get any possible last bit of dust or dirt that could have fallen onto this play field. And then I noticed that I forgot to put some 44 bulbs into my GI sockets. You live. Ah, oh, god damn it. What? Stop it? Yeah. Meanwhile, my clear is there on the stand, just activating away, starting to do its job. So I had to take a quick timeout to find bulbs, then get the bulbs in place, and then do the tack cloth one more time due to all the work that I was doing over the playing field for these bulbs. Now we can actually start shooting. So when shooting this, you wanna go in straight, consistent lines back and forth with a little bit of an overlapping over each time you go over. Now due to past experiences, I can already tell you at this point, I was already like, hmm, this is, doesn't seem like it should. So I immediately start spraying over it again because I'm already getting a little bit concerned. It's like I'm seeing the clear shoot and it's going on to the play field, but it's not really doing what it should. It's not looking like it's leveling out. It seems like it's more like coagulating together and this is not what the typical fashion would look like. Now, definitely at this point is where I started to get concerned. I have a decision to make, guys, and that is either to stop what I'm doing, wipe off as much as I can, sand, and then start over again due to a clear coating issue, or 
which is the preferred option in my opinion, and that is to flood the playfield. That is when I use all the clear that I have to in order to get this playfield completely coated and covered. So I end up going back and forth making a couple of more batches just to make sure I make enough to cover this playfield. Oh, I'm using way more clear than I should guys, but this is what I'm having to do, which sucks. So this is, like I said, the first coat does not go on the way it's supposed to. This is not the typical results, but just to show you as an example that even though your first coat goes on like this, you can still save the playfield and fix the issues. Now I'm going over the play field with the eyedropper to help mix up any kinds of like, you know, areas that were just unseeable at the time with the gun. Just eye dropping here and there, here and there, any kind of low areas that I see. The eye drops is something that you're going to be doing, so you want to make sure that you don't pour all of your clear into your container before you shoot. Leave it a little bit behind so that way after you clear cut your play field, you're able to have some ready and mixed up, ready to go that you can do touch-ups on just here and there. It's very, very useful technique. As you can see, the playfield's got a very nice sheen to it. Uh, granted, it's a very thick coat, but we will be end up chilling that down over the course of the next couple of weeks. Now, like I said earlier in the video, after the first 24 hours, you should have a good top solid coat on your play field. Now it's not cured, but you should be able to touch it and it not be tacky. So I'm actually taking it out of my booth and we're gonna perform the very first sanding. All I'm doing here guys is lightly going over to the play field. Think of it like peeling the scab off of a wound. It's just the top layer to give the wound the ability to breathe again. Also notice the pad and the size that I'm using is very large. So this gives me more surface and level area to go over at one time, making sure that the play field is level. So my primary objective here is to go over this play field a great deal to open up the clear, to give it the ability to cure faster because I've got a very thick first coat and I do not need it to be this thick. So I'll wipe everything off and then I also go over it again with naphtha just to make sure that everything's all cleaned off. Then I'm going to look over the play field and any area that is shiny and reflective is a low area, a low spot in the clear. So this lets me know that there are still some spots that need to be hit before I even attempt at shooting another coat. So I'm just going to walk around the play field and kind of point out certain areas that I'm already noticing as I'm doing this whole sanding process. Now I'm going to let this be the first sanding and I'm going to let the play field sit for another 24 hours. The next 24 hours I'll do another coat of sanding. I'm using a 500 grit by the way. The sanding process is essentially a rinse and repeat guys. I'm going to sand where I believe everything needs to be sanded and then I'll clean it off and go over it to make sure I don't have any low spots. The mixture I'm using that I'm spraying on the plate field is I want to say like 98-99% water and like a drop of like, like dishwashing detergent liquid soap. 
This gives the ability to go over the play field smoothly and slickly without the clear that you're sanding off clogging up your sandpaper. What I'm doing now is getting into the really low spots that I discovered during this process with just a little bit of sandpaper. Now I told you that in order for your clear coat to really stick to the previous version, you need to make sure that it's got some tooth. So I'm getting into these little shallow areas that I can really see with this little bit of sandpaper, getting it down in there and standing around to make sure it's all nice and rough. Now, in order to counter all this, make my next coat easier, I'm going to have a little bit of clear coat mixed up, just enough to where I can use eye drops to fill in these gaps. I'll fill for the low areas and just drop a couple of drops in there and that clear should be cured. I don't know about fully cured, but it should be nice and solid in 24 hours. And then of course, again, I'll do a sanding again. And just like before my first coat, I'm gonna make sure everything has completely been sanded and level and cleaned up, ready to go. And then we're gonna move on to our next coat. Oh man, that looks a lot better. I didn't perform the second coat till maybe, I wanna say even two weeks after my first coat, guys. I spent the next week just sanding a little bit each day to get this down to where I wanted it to be. If you've got the, the tools for a pneumatic sander and air compressor, by all means, use it. <laughs> Mine at the time was broken, so therefore I'm going by hand. And like I stated, I'm doing this in hard mode. The next coat goes down way smoother, guys. But we'll go over that in the next video in the series. That's gonna wrap up this video. If you like what you've seen and maybe even learned something, then give me that thumbs up button down below. And if you haven't already, do not forget to hit subscribe. That way you can be notified of whenever we upload something for your viewing pleasure. Until next time, guys. Peace out.